Um, so, yeah, as Kat mentioned, I'm a researcher at UCL Institute of Education, so I'm not from the psychology department, I'm from the education faculty, and that will sort of show throughout my talk. Um, I'm currently involved in, in two projects that look at young children's play, and I'll be speaking about both of those, and the particular perspective that I take towards play, which I call a multimodal perspective, so I'll explain a bit about what that is. Um, my background is in teaching myself, so I used to be a nursery teacher of children aged three and four for several years, and that's definitely informed as well um, where I'm coming from. If there are things that you want to ask and check along the way, um, please, please do. So um, I'm going to start with a sort of a prologue, if you like, a uh, kind of introduction to my interests that comes from my own work and my own time in the classroom. Actually, outside of the classroom, as you can tell from the picture. So we took the group of three and four year olds to a nearby area of Woodland, in a school near Cambridge. Um, the children were aged three and four, and we took them uh, once a week, every week, um, as a kind of experiment, really. We wanted to go without particular prompts and learning aims in mind. We wanted to follow the young children's interests and follow their uh, play interests. So we went, as kind of adult, um, standing alongside them, accompanying them, watching them, observing them, uh, playing with them, and tried to follow their own fascinations, really. And this was a group, a uh, pair of boys, who kind of challenged us each week, I suppose. Because there were some children that went, when we went to the woodland, they would get interested in building dens, finding little spaces within one of the woods. Some of them would go and they would dig, maybe, like looking underground for, for bits and pieces. Some would go and they would tell stories, make up stories about things that lived in the woods, and so on. But these boys, um, whenever we got to the woods, they would run. They would run really fast and really far, right to the edges and around the edges and through the dense sort of thickety bits in the middle. And this posed several challenges. It posed a challenge in terms of, okay, how do we, uh, how do we see what they're doing? Do we chase after them? Do we run with them? Does that then change their running? How do we kind of uh, listen out for what they're saying as they run, maybe? Uh, is that possible, you know, when they're at a distance and they're far away? And it also raised kind of um, challenges around the status of running in this pedagogical um, nursery. So there were some adults along there with them who made comments um, to teachers, you know, well those children, they're just running. We need to get them settled and focused, you know, like the other children were focused on building or, or making and so on. These ones, they're just running. So it was kind of dismissed as something that wasn't of particular interest. Now these children were focused. They were really focused. They were focused on running. <laughs> so we tried um, to give that some more attention and some more recognition. And I wrote about that with um, an artist who was involved in this project with us, Deb Walensky, um, where we really tried to zero in on, on the running games of these children. So this figure on the top right is when we asked a little boy um, to draw his running patterns. And he'd been saying to us in the woods, this is my magic trick. And he would run out of sight and then reappear. So he was playing with games of kind of um, perspective and knowledge, you know, of one person's knowledge as opposed to the runner's knowledge. And he drew it. He said, this is me, and this is me, and that's my magic trick. So he was kind of able to, to represent aspects of his, of his movement graphically, which we found really interesting. And we noticed through the running that there were all sorts of stories about running together, being together, running away from things. So there, was, there were many layers to this running that had been sort of dismissed. Um, and it was a challenge to, to explore it in depth. We had to think creatively about, about how we would do that. But it's, for me, it's, um, it was an early sort of point of interest that has continued on into my work today around what gets missed and what gets recognised in the way that young children play and explore. So the perspective that I use in my work I call a multimodal perspective. And in its very basic essence, that means um, a recognition that social interactions are constituted in a variety of forms, where language is presumed to be one mode among many. So researchers with a multimodal perspective would be interested in these kinds of modes, as well as speech and writing, modes such as image, moving image, gesture, gaze, facial expression, interaction with objects, layouts, use of space, posture, sound, and music. Instance. And there's a distinction here to be made. Um, multimodal researchers wouldn't use the term nonverbal to talk about these categories 
because to describe something as non-verbal is to position it in relation to something verbal. Um, so to see you know, that the verbal is still given priority and everything else is sort of can be tackled with a broad brush that isn't the verbal. So multimodal researchers will pay attention to the particular modes that are used and their affordances. Affordances being what they make possible and also what they constrain in terms of meaning making. So, um, multimodality is an interdisciplinary approach. It, is done, it understands communication and representation to be about more than language. And um, it then provides a kind of framework for research, for analysis, in which visual, oral, embodied, and spatial aspects of interaction environments are given particular attention. You can tell from this that I'm coming from a different place to um, psychologists, to um, cognitive science. The influences here in particular are from social semiotics, particularly the work, work of Winter Kress and Michael Halliday. So that idea that humans use sign systems that are socially shaped. And a multimodal take on that looks beyond just language or semiotic, but to look at other forms of semiotic uh, tools and resources that humans use. It's also got something in common as an approach with kind of ethnomethodological um, frameworks, so drawing upon kind of anthropology, sociology, and thinking about how people in their everyday lives um, achieve things through their social actions. Any questions about multimodality? So, so it's got, um, I've got some further reading here, and um, this book, Introducing Multimodality, with a particularly good, clear introduction if you wanted to find out more. So I use this multimodal perspective on uh, play. I'm interested in young children's play. And that means that we take as interesting, take as significant aspects of play that are not just verbal, not just spoken or written. So Günther Kress says this. He says children act multimodally, both in the things that they use, the objects they make, and in their engagement to their bodies. There is no separation of body and mind. The differing modes and materials which they employ offer differing potentials for the making of meaning and therefore offer different effective cognitive and conceptual possibilities. But he goes on to say that there tends to be, especially in education, where I'm coming from, there tends to be a focus on language and literacy, and that often children's meaning-making principles more broadly tend to get un go unrecognised, if you like. So those are their practices we call play, we often do not consider as part of communication, and therefore not worthy of real investigation. He says, and no wonder that the child's own semiotic disposition is not recognised in most institu institutional settings. So my interest is in giving recognition, giving attention to those modes in play that might sometimes be um, sort of lost or taken for granted. Whether that's because of uh, the perspectives that are adopted in research, or what I'll focus on today is whether the methods aren't always apt for looking at multimodal play. So, um, what are my research was part of this larger project called MODE, which was funded by the National Centre for Research Methods. And it was um, a four-year project which uh, had the broad aim of developing multimodal methodological approaches, in particular for studying digital data and environments. So recognising from a multimodal perspective that the forms that people use to communicate are increasingly uh, multimodal, where language writing microphones dominated now with the rise of, sort of digital media and so on, um, the texts that we often encounter are likely to be highly multimodal. So there were a range of research projects and um, mine was a community for a play. And the tools um, are also changing for researchers. Increasingly you get small handheld video recording devices like these that make possible video recordings and not the kind of bulky, large, expensive uh, video recorders that you might have had in the past. So video is often increasingly portable, affordable, and it presents uh, the opportunities to get a, a lasting visual and audiovisual record of play in ways that other technologies might not. But it presents new challenges for research, and that was why I was particularly interested in this study. So, the challenge there, in particular, that I'm looking at is the challenge of transcription, the methodological challenge of transcription. So once upon a time, you might have had a tape recorder or a little audio recording device. You would have set it up alongside a, um, an interaction of some kind. And you would have had a, a written, uh, sorry, a, an audio account of, of spoken and other utterances. 
and typical transcription conventions would be about turning that speech essentially into writing. If you have an audiovisual record, do you still follow those same conventions or do you need new conventions, particularly if you're coming from a multimodal perspective where you don't want to disregard all the embodied, spatial, uh, and visual aspects of research? So new challenges for, for new forms of data, which multimodality is interested in, in tackling. Um, Besmer and Mavis have written about transcription, and they say this. They say that with the increasing use of video recording in social research, methodological questions about how to transcribe multimodally are more timely than ever before. How do researchers transcribe gesture, for instance, or gaze? And how can they show the readers of their transcript how such modes operate alongside speech? Should we bother transcribing these at all? Um, and what are the epistemological implications of choices of inclusion or exclusion? Can we include everything? Should we? Is it possible? What does one gain from inclusion of certain modes other than speech if the aim of transcription is always to focus on a selection of the vast amount of data collected? These are big questions and they're definitely very much still open to, to debate and dialogue. But um, my research has tried to probe some of these issues a little bit and I'll show you some examples. So the study I'm going to share um, examples from is, was looking at um, visualising young children's play. And it had two kind of intertwined focuses. So a substantive focus in, in terms of how play is organised multimodally, and a methodological focus in terms of how that video of play might be transcribed multimodally. So I carried out a small scale ethnographic um, study, which was in the nursery classroom where I used to be a teacher. So I went back quite early on in, in my research. I'd, um, I left teaching in the May and I went back to collect the data in the June. So it's the same school year of children. So the 20 children there knew me very well. So we've heard several examples of experimental research. This was very, very much naturalistic research going into the field. And it was quite, um, quite a particular kind of naturalistic research in that I've been their teacher and they, they saw me as their teacher and I was going back into a setting that I was very familiar with. So in that sense, it was kind of as naturalistic as possible, although I was taking on a, admittedly a, a different role, a researcher role while I was there. So I collected um, video recordings of the young children's play, and in early years <coughs> in the UK, um, they tend to operate on sort of free-flow, child-initiated play sort of um, approach, at least in, when they're about three and four they do. So there was a, a room set up with many different activities, resources like computer, blocks, water tray, sand tray, and so on. And the children could, for the most part, choose what they played with and when. So I, um, I used the, the, vid the video recorder to try and get little episodes of different types of child-initiated play. Sometimes playing in pairs, sometimes playing alone, um, sometimes playing in larger groups, and with a different range of materials that were on offer, both inside and outside. Just before I show you some of the clips of video and talk about how I multimodally transcribe them, I wanted to talk a little bit about transcription again, and, um, and in particular how I position transcription in research. Because that model that I told you about, that sort of transferring speech into writing, um, sometimes carries with it certain assumptions about, uh, about meaning and about knowledge. So um, my work very much sees transcription well, maybe to say what it doesn't see it as. It doesn't see it as a kind of intermediary technical stage in research. Sometimes, you know, maybe if you've got lots of interviews, you would send them off to a transcriber, you would get them back, and that would be, would be the kind of the extent of the consideration that you give given to transcription. In multimodal research, when you're making um, selections from a, a vastly rich audiovisual data source and you're thinking about how that gets re represented, you are making interpretive decisions at every step of the way. You are making choices about what you leave out, what you foreground and background, and so on. And so I like this quote from Tilly, which says that um, every transcript is not transparent, but it retains the fingerprints of the transcriber, if you like, the interpretive and analytical and theoretical fingerprints. So it recognises transcription as a process that's always partial, that's always shaped by theory, politics, sometimes professional vision, and it's always a process of change, translation or transformation, or as in multimodal research, we would call it transduction, in that you're moving from one mode into another mode, and that you always then inevitably change the meaning slightly when you represent something differently. 
And rather than seeing all of this as a kind of head scramblingly problematic aspect of research, I'm interested in what it does analytically and rhetorically, in that actually the way you re-represent your research can enable certain noticings. It can act as an analytical device. And it can also be a rhetorical device in that you can use a transcript to develop and take a reader or a, a viewer, an audience, through an argument. So I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by that um, by showing you a few examples. So as I said already, I was there in a teacher researcher role. The children were um, three and four years old, it's a group of 20 of them, and they were in this nursery that was a free flow play space. I recorded the observations with a handheld video camera, in a way trying to capture recordings that I might have done as a teacher. I would, the children were used to seeing me with you know, notebooks, pencils, paper, um, cameras and so on. And I was trying to use the camera in a way that I'm the kind of way that I might have done as a teacher, so capturing little episodes of their play, admittedly for a different purpose. And then I use multimodal transcription as a kind of fine grain analytical tool. So the first example that I'm going to show you is of children playing a computer game. Um, this game was from a, a game called Simple City, uh, made by Too Simple. And the aim of the game essentially was that you could click and drag these objects and you could drag them into the different containers. So the can would go into the metal, for instance, the plastic and so on. And um, if you got it into the right one, you got a little kind of animation or sound effect usually, a kind of crash or a scrunching sound, that sort of thing. And um, if you didn't, there was kind of, there was no penalty, the, the objects would just sort of um, drop back and stuff. So it's very much geared towards the success and through elimination, I suppose. And um, ostensibly a kind of simple sorting test, right? Um, so here's a little clip of two children in the nursery playing that game. Because I was doing such naturalistic kind of free flow observation of the children, I didn't set up screen capture recording or anything like that, so you can't see what's on the screen, but you can infer through the, you can hear sound effects and you can see Toby's use of the mouse, so you can kind of tell what's, what's happening. He's basically dragging some of these objects into, um, into these different containers. So, um, yeah, the first thing I did was was try transcribing this verbatim, if you like, kind of the typical, most conventional form of transcription, trying to convert speech into language, and that looked like this. So she says, I need my wine bottle for my, it's so lovely, so lovely, it's so lovely, I need it for my, but I need that for my sister, and then she said something I still can't hear, even though I've listened to it many times, birthday, don't throw that away. So, it was a transcript, okay, it's a transcript of that video, but what does it miss out? Sorry? A lot. A lot, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're only paying attention to speech, you miss out the entire other participant, don't you? You miss out Toby, he, he was very much present, he was laughing, he was using his gaze, and so on. Um, so what it does, a verbatim transcript, does help to make things that are inaudible, you know, to, to help understanding of speech, but it very much misses out the kind of many of the other modes involved in that interaction in that play. So I then talked about, well, are there other existing conventions that could be kind of repurposed for this? And I looked to um, an approach called conversation analysis, which has developed very systematic um, conventions for transcribing features of speech. So some of the features here, you know, raise in pitch or um, a pause denoted by time in brackets, emphasis and so on. And, you know, this then did make um, Toby present, and it, there are sort of some conventions you can use for transcribing laughter. So, you know, it's, it's an attempt to represent that here. But it's still a very partial account, very partial um, transcript, um, particularly in that it focuses so much on, on conversation, by its very definition, it focuses on language still. And there are some conversation analysts who do try and do a bit more of the um, bringing in gaze. Goodwin's work, Heath's work, and so on, and do sort of call themselves multimodal conversation analysts. Um, analysts. So, um, you know, that was an experiment, sort of looking at what got foregrounded, what got um, gained, what was lost. And another typical approach, often used in multimodal research, actually, is to kind of separate out mode by mode. So, to, you would separate out gaze, you would separate out sound effects, and so on, which works to, um, you know, look at a tiny extract in quite a lot of detail going through second by second, but it's, it places quite a lot of demands on the reader. 
The CA one does in that you need to understand conventions. This one does in terms of how do you read it? Do you read mode by mode? Do you read along a timeline? Um, do you look across? Do you look diagonally? And so on. It gives the reader, the audience, many choices in terms of how they work through this transcript, if you like. And that can have benefits and shortcomings. Uh, what I ended up doing in the end was um, developing an approach that's kind of informed by Jeff Bezemer's work. He works in a different context. He works in the operating theatre. But he was looking at um, using a timeline to develop, to, to, to create a transcript of license. Um, so what I did, and this is discussed more in this paper, so I won't talk too much about it, but um, I separated out voice and gaze onto sort of different tiers and the mouse use and looked at them over time rather than fragmenting it into sort of um, a grid-like transcript or matrix like this, trying to look at an episode holistically as it unfolded, so putting time as a kind of anchor mode on this. And in particular, I was interested in points when Toby lifted, it, lifted his hand off the mouse and how he then turned and looked at Ellie and laughed. And I noticed through transcribing in this way certain um, kind of rhythms and patterns to the interaction, perhaps because it is itself a little bit like a musical score, you know, it drew attention to these sort of patterns, these diagonal patterns, where he lifted the mouse off, looked at Ellie, smiled, laughed. And also this moment of intensity here, where there's a long period of laughter, Ellie raises her voice. She's previously stared fixedly at the screen, and then she looks at him several times and smiles. You can see in the photograph. And so these moments sort of alerted me to the fact that we might well look at that kind of interaction and, and code it, if you like, as confrontation. You know, she's saying, no, don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. She's very persistent about that. And yet, looking at it multimodally, we see the playfulness of we see the fact that there's a game here, there's a teasing game, isn't there? There's a kind of, no, don't do that, and then a pleasure in, in kind of defying her rules. And also a moment where they check the play, where they look at each other and they smile. So they're in on this together, it's a kind of a pretense. So it might look on the surface like it's just a sorting game, but actually, through multimodal analysis, you can maybe say that it's a, it's a game of pretense. It's a social game where they're kind of working on testing boundaries so that was the kind of um, some of the interpretations that I drew from doing this kind of analysis, this kind of transcription, where the transcript was very much an analytical device in itself. It enabled noticing that might otherwise have gone sort of been invisible. The second example I want to show kind of goes back to that um, that example I started with in the woods, the running games. So I felt like I, you know, developed a sort of transcript design that had principles. Um, rooted in multimodality for looking at these children of computer, could it work for this kind of example of play, or were different kinds of transcript designs necessary? I'll play this, um, this example before I show you what I did. So I had different episodes of play from my, from my field work, um, and I transcribed them in different ways, but this one was by far the hardest <laughs> to transcribe, and I'll, I'll show you why. So I started out naively, I think, trying to separate out, you know, movement, gesture, gaze, that was on the sort of uh, timeline. This is using a program called ELAM that was developed by the Max Planck Institute, actually, for looking at um, sociolinguistics, I think. And it just, you know, it really fragmented up the play and did not convey that sort of dynamic, spatial, embodied aspect of their placement in space over time, if you like. So I knew I needed something kind of different. And I thought, well, I did a few sort of doodles on the back of a notebook or something, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe something more spatial, more visual, um, might help to bring it attention to the to the embodied and physical notes. So I tried to develop a sort of map-like transcript, um, taking a like a bird's eye view of the playground. So I started off with, um, so trying to represent some of the objects that were fixed in space, like the bench that they ran around, the willow tunnel. Um, the trees and so on. And then mapping each child, and actually the whole abstract I mapped, but it looks like a sort of tangled spaghetti when you look at the whole thing. So I'm just going to show you the parts of it to try and try and break it down. And I know this is very, very micro, and it can get like that with multimodality, but it's worth bearing in mind that I'm not analysing massive data sets, and this is very in-depth, fine-grained research. So short extracts looked at in great detail. 
Um, so this was um, Billy, the boy in the green t-shirt, and the loop that he makes from 25 seconds, so from the point when um, he starts, the, starts chasing. Um, being pursued by George in the red t-shirt, so representing the children and their sort of tracks of locomotion, if you like. Uh, the other children that run into the space. And trying to show the direction through arrows, but also to give it a sense of time. So I tried putting these arrows at roughly one second intervals. So you can tell when they're running at greater speed because they're further apart, mm. and when they slow down because they're closer together. It's really hard to try and get a sense of time and sort of movement in something that's static and visual and fixed, but um, sort of trying to give a sense of the speed through the way that it's designed. Including the pauses, so when they came together and discussed at the end about going inside. And putting on some of the speech that I could make out, so uh, Billy says to George, your turn, your turn to be the chaser. Just going inside for a little drink, me too. And that's when they go in. And again, through the kind of act of transcribing, it started to um, draw my attention to, to the points of the, of the play, to parts of the play. In particular, I kind of was interested in the way that they loop around this, and then they do another sort of little loop before coming to a standstill. It's quite a short game of chase. I wondered what the significance of this moment was, and I, so in the transcript I've included um, a video still from this moment, which draws attention to George's gesture at that point. He was doing a very sort of strong outstretched arm gesture as he walked around in that circle. Um, and for me this drew attention to a particular phenomenon that's been discussed in play research more generally. The Opies, who did a, an archive play from the, from the 50s and 60s in the UK, catalogued young children's use of truce terms. Um, where I grew up, it was you crossed your fingers. <coughs> you sort of you said a particular word, this word skinch, meaning like, you can't get me. Is the word in Swedish that you use? Uh, Danish that you use? Yeah, yeah. 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 Or sometimes it's time out now. A lot of the children use time out. And it's kind of, it's called a truce term, because it's not exactly giving up, and it's not exactly um, allowing yourself to be caught. It's not surrendering. It's kind of a term that's often developed amongst communities of children themselves to kind of pause the play, to so allow someone to tie a tube and go in for a drink or so And it seemed to me that these children were kind of inventing, creating, if you like, through action, their own sort of truce, simple truce message. So they were doing this, and they were also conveying quite sophisticated messages between them about who was chasing when. It wasn't a fixed sort of um, standardised set of rules about, you know, I'm the chaser, you're the escapee. They were very much sort of communicating through the action the rules of who was chasing when and when the game would stop. It wasn't always verbalised, but the action, paying attention to the action, kind of um, showed how creative the children were being about developing these rules and roles through the action. Um, I talk a bit about the development of that transcript. I mention it because it's in Danish and uh, uh, it was um, written for Defoe, so it's written for a teacher audience, but uh, that goes into a little bit more detail about the design of the running game transcript. And also another one that I did that was using a kind of comic strip format to look at some children's block play at the time. And um, if you're interested in looking at other examples, other ways that, that multimodal researchers have um, try to transcribe interaction multimodally. We created as part of the mode project a transcription bank where researchers would submit their transcripts alongside which they included a, um, a commentary about how they designed the transcript, how they made it, what purposes it served, and so on. So for more examples, particularly using music notation, and, um, you know, sort of dance notation, things like that, trying to address the same problem of how you represent the multimodal complexity of play particularly when you've got video data. So, for me, multimodal empirical material, the representation of it can act as this noticing device, and discovery procedure, and a means of recognising aspects of play that might otherwise be overlooked. But, it comes with considerations, I think. I think we need to always acknowledge the selectivity of all transcripts. They always make certain choices, whether those are implicit or very explicitly made. And recognising that transcription is transduction always involves a remaking. I think that we need to consider the affordance of modes of transcription. What can you do visually? What can you do through layout in terms of how you uh, convey your data? And I think 
I think there's value to be had in experimenting with transcription, actually. There's quite a lot of diverse and creative approaches out there, and I think that that's actually, rather than aiming to standardise it, I think that there, that there's some validity in that. There's some, uh, some insights that can be developed through different varied transcript designs, but that that involves principal choices and critical reflection on those decisions. And often that's absent from research reports. Often it's a kind of, you know, the, research, the, the data was transcribed, if that, within the paper. And, you know, sometimes there's some value in looking more closely. And of course the ethical issues, which isn't something I've touched on so much, but um, when you're working with audiovisual data, you've got ethical issues. When you're thinking about how that gets re-represented in a presentation or in a paper and so on, um, there's a part of transcription to play in that as well. So some people do uh, use transcripts to anonymize their audiovisual data. You know, you'll get a sort of negative still or a blurred image. Um, I have permission to use the children's images in this for certain audiences, so, so I've been able to. So, kind of um, moving this on a little bit back to my interest in education and my kind of pedagogical um, interest in research. I wanted to think about whether it was just researchers that faced these challenges of how to represent audiovisual material, or whether there was value in sort of applying some of these principles to practice as well, to education. And Besmer and Kress talk about this, this process of making things visible, which I really like. They say, each trace of semiotic work demonstrates learning. Every sign and every sign complex is a sign of learning, regardless of whether and to what degree others, guides or instructors or teachers, are there to shape the learner's engagement. In a social semiotic approach, the aim is to document, analyse and evaluate what is learned, not what is not learned. It is no to notice and render visible learning that often goes unnoticed and that being taken for granted has been too often remains invisible. I think this in terms of the early years foundation stage, which is the curriculum the age phase for young children up to, um, to five in the UK, Practitioners get this kind of guidance. They get asked to observe, for observational assessment, the things that young children do, which at their play. And they say that settings can choose to record learning in any way that they like, including video, electronic recordings, and so on. But this is the example that is presented in the guidance. Very highly um, text-based, writing-based, and um, you know, what can you capture through words that gets missed, um, what gets missed when you only capture or tend to capture the majority of in words and reported speech. And a colleague at the IOE, Alice Bradbury, has, um, has looked at this in some, some detail. So she noticed that in early years foundation stage profiles, which is the assessment that children go through in England at the age of five, um, children were able to show that they were good learners if they were able to verbalise their learning or if they were able to take physical evidence for them. So if they were to say, you know, look at my model or um, look at my drawing, they were kind of considered recognisable, valid signs of learning, whereas the kind of the examples that I was showing you, the very embodied, ephemeral, dynamic things that sort of evaporate if you miss them, um, were not recognised as signs of learning. So we've got a kind of issue, I think, here in practice. And one of the alternative perspectives that I'm interested in looking at, because I think it does a different job of giving recognition to aspects of children's play is the Reggio Media approach, which Kat um, mentioned at the start. This is an approach which could be a whole other problem itself, really, thanks. Um, which very much values the concept of the children's hundred languages expression, where that's not just verbal written languages, but um, you know, uh, model making, light play, use of objects, drawing, role play, acting, and so on. So they say children possess a hundred languages, a hundred ways, ways of thinking, of expressing themselves, of understanding and encountering others, with a way of thinking that creates connections between different dimensions of experience rather than separating them. And they say it's the responsibility of the infant toddler centre and preschool to give value and equal dignity to all those languages. So they would recognise that you can do things in clay that you can't do in writing, that you can do things in movement that you can't do in clay, and so on. And they very much encourage children to move between these different forms in order to, um, to construct meanings differently, to understand concepts from different um, perspectives. And they work very hard in Reggio Media to give visibility to those languages, to give recognition to them. 
This is a form of documentation that they use as part of their kind of ongoing pedagogical documentation. Um, so there's columns here for the different children and the teacher, photographs, little drawings, um, you know, little diagrams. And it's not dissimilar to a kind of multimodal transcript, is it? It's trying to, to face some of those same challenges. And this is work done by teachers, done by practitioners with young children. <coughs> so I think they're recognising Reggio also that this act of documentation can be a noticing device. It can be an analytical tool and something that gives visibility and recognition to play. And Gunilla Dahlberg talks about it as pedagogical documentation and that it always involves choice. Choices among many and the choices in which pedagogues themselves are participating. And she makes this tricky, tricky statement, that which we do not choose is also a choice. So that which we do not choose to represent in our documentation also implies a choice. Um, and that we can be constructors of children, co-constructors of children's lives and embody our implied principles. So actually looking at what gets documented can show to us, to, to researchers, to educators themselves, what gets privileged, what gets recognised. And that's what I'm looking at in a project that I started in October, that's going up until, um, on a, until September this year, which is looking in more depth at practitioners' um, use of digital technologies in particular for recognising and representing children's play. So in the UK, we have lots of these apps now aimed at uh, teachers to um, kind of speed up the process of observation. So you, you tap a child, you tap a learning objective, and it you know, sometimes gets sent to parents and so on. And they're being used really widely. I don't know if it's the same here in Denmark, but um, you know, often practitioners are moving towards this because it saves time, it saves paper, and so on. But built into their design are all sorts of um, you know, considerations about what gets recognised and what doesn't. So I'm going to be looking with the teachers themselves around the practices to do with using digital technology as well as um, paper and, and more traditional technologies. The other way that um, I'm trying to explore this methodological issue of how we research play is through a project called Playing the Archive, which is running for two years, um, funded by the EPSRC. And in this one, we're looking at children's playground play in particular, building on that archive of play in the UK that I mentioned. We're trying to use the tools that are available to us now as researchers to um, sort of capture aspects of play using digital technologies that might otherwise be, be missed. So we're using technology like motion capture sensors, GPS um, trackers, hopefully drones if we get possibility of flying in London, or at least some of some top-down video recordings, and um, children wearing worn cameras, head cameras and chest cameras. So some new perspectives on play brought about by digital technologies that I think is going to be quite exciting. And just finally, um, another way that I've been applying a multimodal perspective on play is um, you might recognise the Lego house. So I was in Denmark last month for a short 10-day visit to go and look at Lego, and I was looking in particular at the design of the exhibits, the um, play opportunities presented in uh, the Lego house, and in particular how they brought together and blurred boundaries between the physical and the digital. So how those modes um, and the affordances of those modes invite certain kinds of play and exploration. And it's kind of ongoing because I didn't collect any footage of children engaging in these activities. I've just been looking at them as sort of um, tools, if you like, semiotic opportunities. Um, but that's another way that a multimodal perspective can kind of look at the gains and losses of different types of, of play environments. So to summarize, um, my belief is that committed and respectful interest and attention towards the multimodality of play highlights the complexity and richness of sometimes seemingly small and fleeting moments which might easily otherwise be overlooked in busy classrooms. So I use multimodal transcription as a tool to show meaning where it might not normally be looked for, seen or recognised and shows agency and design where it might not immediately be apparent. Apt methodological tools and dispositions are needed for that kind of approach, um, but I believe that through doing that we can notice and then give value to the meaning making of many. So, so I'm happy to answer any questions or reflections, comments. <coughs>